Hello, Global Gardeners. Welcome to another wonderful Monday when we talk gardening and get to spend an hour and a half together just enjoying each other's company, asking questions, answering questions. Today, we'll be talking about protecting your garden, a number of different ways that you can do that and kind of a mindset that you need to have when it comes to protecting your garden. Shout out to the world's best moderators, Heidi, Heidi and Jay, and also Riverdale Gardens. Nice to have you here today as well. It's so nice to see everybody on this Monday. Let's go ahead and start right with a question from Brian Siebert. Thank you so much, Brian, for that contribution. I tried predatory nematodes for my Colorado potato beetles and trying some insect frass to help fight off squash bugs. Any thoughts? So nematodes can be a great way to combat some of these devastating pests we have. And as you probably have already discovered, there's a number of different types of nematodes that you can buy that will specifically target the Colorado potato beetles. And so a great thing to start with. I recently read of a study that actually showed some of those nematodes will will combat using chemicals as well. So not only are they in the soil attacking the, the larva and, and killing those, beetle, well, the, those beetles while they're still in the ground, they can also give a signal that, hey, we're here. And the potato beetles pick up on that signal and are less likely to attack the plant. So having the nematodes in the soil can fight those pests, but they can also deter those pests from coming to that bed that has the nematodes in it. So win-win on that. And as far as insect frass, that's an interesting question. So I've talked about horse manure, cow manure. I've talked about manures of all type, alpaca manures, rabbit manure. Well, insect manure is called frass. And so you can buy frass and it's primarily used as a fertilizer, just like most manures are. And I haven't used it, but the way frass works like any other manure is it will add nutrients to the soil for the plant. But another study that I, had, I saw recently, a little while back when I was actually looking into frass, it's one of those things that, that the the ingredients of the frass fertilizer can actually strengthen the plant and make the leaves stronger. And so I think it's a, it's a great way to combat these pests, Brian. Uh, you're right on the right track. The nematode should show some good results. The frass, while it's not going to fight the pests, it should make for stronger plants. And stronger plants are better able to fight off some of these insect pests. Gives you more time to, to see the pests and then maybe uh, deal with them. And when it comes to squash bugs, for instance, <coughs> squash bugs like to hide underneath areas of the garden, leaf piles, old uh, plants that you've pulled up. And one way to combat them is to actually take cardboard and lay the cardboard around your plants and the the squash bugs will hide underneath that cardboard so you might be able to go out every morning lift up that cardboard get those squash bugs squash the squash bugs and with the plant being strong already you'll be able to to move forward so uh thanks for that question thanks for that contribution that's a nice way to start the day and then i saw another one i want to go ahead and scroll down N4B1K1 says, I'm new to dealing with deer. Does Repel-X and other chemical deer repellents work? Or am I better wrapping young trees in chicken wire? So I have a video. It's, it's an older video on, on dealing with deer in the garden. And really, the only way to keep your plants safe away from the deer is with a barrier. And so as I showed in just the video that I, I released my snowy video on Saturday, that's what I've been doing with all of my trees is putting wire fences around them to help keep the deer away. That really is 
the best way to do it. I also use bird netting as a barrier. The Repellix, the homemade remedies, all those other things you can buy to include mountain lion manure will work to a certain degree. But, you know, put yourself in the mind of the deer. <laughs> You're strolling through a garden and there's this weird smell and it might deter you. You might want to go to an area where that smell isn't there. Over time, one of a couple things is going to happen. It's going to rain or snow or you're going to water and that repellent is going to wash off or be diluted. And so the deer walk through again, they notice the odor, but now it's not as strong and they'll come right back into your garden. Or they walk by, smell the smell, the next day, smell the smell, and then after a few days, they realize it smells bad. But those tulips taste really good, and there's nothing harming me. It just smells bad. And so I've seen many times, and I know many gardeners who have tried the repellents, and the deer still eat the tulips and all the other plants in the garden because the plant is tastier, and maybe the deer is hungrier then the the repellent is uh, harming the deer with a bad smell. So I don't typically recommend those type of odorous repellents just because they don't work for a very long time at all. I did have success using soap, um, both a soap that my wife had made intentionally to keep deer away with a really strong odor and it does work pretty well but over time i noticed the deer walking right by where i had the soap hanging and that's why i can say this because from experience uh, both iris spring soap and the soap that my wife made they get used to it and they'll just stick their nose in a different area and eat the plants and uh, you know it may work for a couple days there, there you can practice some some variation so use one type of odor in one area and then move it to another area and as long as you just keep moving things around you might have some better success with that but use the barrier and that's really the the best way to try to get them out of your garden or keep them from coming into your garden so let's talk a little bit about protecting your garden be it the barriers to keep the deer and the other pests away or or the weather like i've been having to deal with recently you, you more than likely have insurance for medical conditions. Medical insurance, almost all of us have. And it's one of those things that hopefully you never have to use it, but you have it available. And there are so many things like that in our lives that we prepare for, and we might not actually be using it right now. If you are saving and investing for retirement, well, that's money you're not using right now, but years from now, you're going to be using it and it's going to come at a very important time. That's the way I like to look at how we protect our garden is actually taking measures to protect the garden long before the garden actually needs protection. And then when that event happens, when that pest shows up, you're ready for it. And so let's let's go ahead and start with the the deer and and how you can protect your garden from deer i have deer that occasionally come to my garden i haven't seen them in a number of weeks mala does a great job patrolling and barking and keeping them out but occasionally and it's usually late at night a deer will show up in the garden mala will be barking her head off i'll go out and the deer isn't isn't really scared away by Mala, it's more scared away by me. But if I see a deer in my garden late at night, occasionally that probably means they're there more often. That's why I put those barriers around my fruit trees. I may never have a deer in my garden again, or I might only get a deer in the garden once or twice, but that's all it takes is one night and the trees can be devastated. After I retired from the Galileo School Garden Project, I went back to visit and, and it was really disheartening. I had planted, 
I don't know, I think it was 12 or 15 fruit trees in the garden. They were doing pretty well. And, and some vandals had cut a hole in the fence, come in and did a little bit of damage. It really wasn't that bad. But because it was a school, you had to put in to the school to repair the fence. You know how that typically goes. Well, there was a hole in the fence. And one day, a deer came through that hole into the garden and pretty much ate all the fruit trees, all of the young tips, all of the growing branches on those fruit trees. We had a big fence around the garden, and all it takes is one hole, one night, for a single deer to devastate the garden. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about, is the planning for the worst case scenario. So that if you are fencing your plants or have a barrier to keep a pest away from your plant, you have to anticipate that if that gets a hole in it, if it blows down, if it falls apart, now your protection is lost and you'll need to, to fix it. And, you know, I, I, I hate to, to speak from experience to say it's going to happen at the worst time, but that's how we have to look at some of these things we do with our gardening. Nematodes, great question as well from Brian. That's a way to protect your plants from a pest like the Colorado potato beetle. If you have particular pests in your garden, you can anticipate their arrival and be proactive by putting nematodes in the soil so that those nematodes, either with that chemical deterrence or by actually eating the pupa and the larva that are in the soil, you've protected your plants from the Colorado potato beetle long before that pest ever shows up. So we'll be talking more specifics over the course of, of the rest of the show and try to give you some ideas of things you can do to protect your plants. I do want to say right up front that we will be announcing the winner of the autographed copy of Tony O'Neill's book, Composting Master Class. And we had a great response for, for all of you who had put Composting Master Class in the, the comments from last week. And so that'll be coming up here a little bit later in the show, and we'll be announcing the winner of the free book, free autographed book. Okay, so let's see. So Leslie Scully's asking a good one. Um, what about voles and pocket gophers? So I do that as well. I have voles and pocket gophers in my garden. And so I, I mention it occasionally on the live stream and and if you look closely in my in my videos, you can see that I do it. And I mention it a couple times. But underneath all of my raised beds, I have wire barriers. And and it's one of those things that that's how I'm protecting the plants in that bed from voles and pocket gophers. You have to anticipate the specific pest. And so in the case of voles, which are just a, a mouse-sized animal, that burrows very close to the surface. And so in an area like mine, where I'm using wood chip mulch in my pathways, that's ideal for voles to actually burrow underneath that mulch to get to the beds. Big reason why I have raised beds. And then I have hardware cloth, which has a very small opening. I'm using half inch hardware cloth for most of those beds. So if the, vo the voles burrow th to that bed, they can't get into the bed because of that barrier that's buried in the ground. So we're talking about the deer barriers that would be above ground. You can also put barriers below ground. And in the other areas of my garden where the gophers, pocket gophers, are a bigger concern, same thing. But I typically use a double layer of chicken wire just because it's cheaper than hardware cloth and it is also effective against the gophers but i have that underneath all my bed so when the gophers are burrowing now they can't get into the bed mala does a great job of digging for the gophers and what i found in my cinder block bed for instance even the cinder block bed that's only eight inches high but i dug down a trench before i put that bed in place laid down that wire, and then put the cinder block around it. Well, 
what I found, and this is this is a learn from my, it wasn't necessarily a mistake, but I didn't anticipate it. So the inside of the bed is protected by the wire underneath it. And I laid the cinder block around the edges of the wire. Well, inside those cinder blocks, those little small openings, and I've got some herbs growing in there, got some chamomile and some thyme and some strawberries growing in my cinder blocks in those little square holes. I didn't put wire underneath that part of the cinder block. And sure enough, I've seen that either the voles or the gophers have dug holes into those squares, not into the bed, but into the actual cinder blocks. So anticipating the pest you have and then trying to anticipate the kind of protection you need can be difficult and you may not figure it out entirely as I saw in this case. And so I've been trying to figure out what I'm going to do about the, the cinder block openings. Uh, and right now I'm just letting Mala dig all over that bed to try to either s deter those gophers and voles and drive them into another area or maybe actually catch one or two and send the signal not to come to my garden. But those are the kind of things I'm talking about. I put all that wire in place, anticipating that it could be a problem. And so far I haven't had a problem because I had taken that action. I don't have the, the, the gophers and the bulls in my beds. So uh, that's, that's what I do about it. I, I do not poison just because I've got uh, a, a pet that likes to go after animals. So the last thing I want is my dog to actually find a gopher that's been poisoned. So I don't recommend that. You can trap a lot of these pests that are coming to your garden. But in my experience and, and what I've seen is with squirrels, for instance, in areas I've lived that had a worse squirrel problem than I have here. If you trap a squirrel, another squirrel is going to move in. There are enough squirrels everywhere and there are enough raccoons and there are enough gophers and voles and everything else that if you trap one or two or three, you're just opening up the space for more to move in because they're looking for homes. Some have already found your garden as a home. If you get rid of them, others will now call your garden home. So I prefer to deal with the pests I have and that I know about than to really try to get rid of them and just invite more of them in. But if I can deter all of them away from the area with a barking dog, with these barriers, and with some of the other control actions, I think that can be a pretty effective way to, to do it. So, okay, let's see. I think I just saw, I'm scrolling up a little bit. Um, I just saw somebody check in. Was that in the garden with Eli and Kate that I saw check in? I'm not sure about that. I'm going to scroll up. But if, if you're here, welcome. It's nice to have you here. And always nice to have the regulars returning. Scrolling down to see what I may or may not have missed. Um, Laurelful saying, would filling the holes with rocks help any? And so if, if we're talking about burrowing animals, uh, this is one of those things that, so so with my gophers, I've, I've tried mothballs, I've tried castor oil, I've tried putting rocks over the, the entrances of the tunnels, and uh, that, they just go someplace else and it, it it doesn't it doesn't deter them i've actually used those those big torpedo shaped vibrating uh, rods that you bury in the ground and that vibration is supposed to deter some of those bur burrowing animals and it works just kind of like the deer repellent in that area for a period of time and then they get used to it and they come back to that area and so um, whatever you're doing like with a rock, if you cover the entrance of a burrow with a rock, they'll just branch off to the side and dig up around it. And it really hasn't done much in the way of, of deterring or keeping them out. And that's, that's why I've just grown to accept that I've got some of these pests. And so I've modified my gardening because I've got those kind of pests. 
raised beds with the wire underneath is a way that I've chosen to do it just because I live in an area that has gophers and voles and there's always going to be gophers and voles and I can maybe minimize their activity by having a digging dog but I can definitely keep them out of my beds by having the the wire buried underneath. Riverdale says I made my dog Molly's run on the outside of my garden fence 10 feet wide along one side I'm going to build one side per year until I have a dog moat I've been calling it. That's a great idea. I really like that idea. And and same kind of thing. The, so you've got two things acting here. Actually having the dog run so you'll have some fencing all the way around so that fencing will keep some if not most of the pests out. But then the activity of the dog is enough to also keep the the pests out. And so it's a lot of work. It can be a lot of money. It's a lot of effort. But that's the question we have to ask ourselves is what do we need to do to protect our garden and how much of it are we willing to do i've shown and and i'll be i'll be uh, highlighting it in videos to come but the the newest big area of my garden that that raised bed area with the posts 25 feet by 25 feet i covered with hail cloth same kind of thing. I got so tired of so many years with my garden being devastated by hailstorms at the worst possible time that I modified my gardening. I modified how I build my garden so that now I have this big area that is completely covered by hail cloth in the summer. And so we only had one big hailstorm last year, but it worked. So it wasn't terribly expensive. It was a lot of effort. But I didn't lose a single plant in that area last year because I had that hail cloth. Total success. The year before, I lost almost every single plant in that space because of hail. So it's a policy. It's an insurance policy for what might or might not happen. And if you are willing to do the investment, you can protect your plants from some of those major kinds of events. So Goof is saying, what do you do about skunks climbing over the fence? <coughs> so um, <laughs> I had skunks at the last house. I haven't seen any skunks at this house. And so skunks are one of those issues where when when the skunks would come over, this uh, lily would just run out and bark at anything that was out there. But as soon as you get that aroma wafting through the window, I wouldn't let lily run outside so as much as i'd love to have a dog chase away a skunk this is another part of that insurance policy i don't want to have to be washing my dog after a skunk attack it's it's one of those things so one way to protect your garden from from the animals is to understand the animal so in some cases skunks will be going after very specific parts of your garden for very specific reasons. So at the school garden, we had skunks that would climb the fence and they would be feeding on the grubs. And so now this is one of those things. What kind of grubs are they feeding on? So if they're feeding on the beetle larva, like like the, the Colorado potato beetle, then which is worse? You know, you have to you have to try to look at it that way. The the skunks would dig in the beds they would really disrupt the soil quite a bit, but there were no grubs in that bed. There were no beetles in any of the beds that the skunks would come into. And there are a lot of those other kind of pests that the skunks might actually be considered a beneficial animal in your garden, if you can handle where they're digging. To keep them out of your beds, well, you gotta put a barrier over them. Put some of the bird netting, put some of the chicken wire, keep them out of the beds that that you're most concerned about and and for most of the the damage that can take place in our garden one of the the best ways to anticipate it and protect your plants is with hoops and so i love my cattle panel hoops i, I show how i made those in a video you see them in my videos all the time i'll put the hoops over my garden beds and then leave them in place most of the season because those hoops play multi purposes in the garden. I can put plastic over those hoops in springtime to help keep the beds warm. 
I can put shade cloth over those hoops in summer to help keep the beds cool. I can put hail cloth over those hoops when I'm expecting a thunderstorm. I can put plastic again at the end of the season to keep those plants protected. I can put a row cover fabric over the entire bed using those hoops as a support to keep out the insect pests that are looking to either eat my plants or lay eggs on my plants. So hoops, I think, are just one of those things that if you're not doing it, seriously consider doing it because you can modify the hoops against whatever your pest happens to be. My strawberry bed at the last house, I was concerned about the rabbits and the mice and the skunks and anything else and the squirrels that might come in and eat my strawberries. So I had a low hoop over the strawberries and I had bird netting over that hoop all the time. And then when it and and I had them anchored the bird netting anchored into the ground with garden staples, and when it came time to harvest the strawberries, I knew where the staples were and I could just pull them up, reach my hand underneath the bird netting, harvest the strawberries, and then put the bird netting back in place. So, I think hoops are a great way to deal with just about anything that's going to come into our garden to try to to eat or harm our plants and you can modify it however you want to modify it so uh, the the actual fence that the skunks are crawling over I don't think there's really much you can do but if you start looking at what you can do to protect your individual beds and your individual plants yeah there's definitely a lot that you can do Eileen's wondering how can I protect a six foot high trellis and so uh, again it depends on the the pest and so one of the things that that i've been working with that uh, around my fruit trees is i i i got the 10 foot long metal conduit the the kind that you can get at lowe's or home depot that you string wires through and so i buried that metal conduit next to my fruit trees and then i have the bird netting strung from the top of that conduit all over the top of my fruit trees. And right now my fruit trees are only four and five feet tall, but you could do the same kind of thing in a six foot trellis is put something like a tall pipe or wood post along the outside of the trellis and then just string the bird netting between those posts to cover that trellis. I've also, the, the, I like to use my cattle panel six foot high trellises for my tomatoes, and I've done the same thing with that. I've thrown shade cloth, and I've shown, thrown hail cloth, and I've thrown bird netting over the, the actual trellis. And the plants may grow through it. I try to do it before they get that tall, but you can use the actual trellis to support whatever it is that you're trying to to protect your plants from. So uh, think about those as a couple options. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, oh, is Brian from Next Level Gardening here? Well, that would be great. I didn't see you check in as well. Great channel. You know, every week I like to give a shout out to uh, to wonderful channels. So yeah, next level gardening. I appreciate that. Scott's got great info. Appreciate it. Next level gardening is is another uh, one of those channels. Uh, and I think was it last week or the week before? I was talking about uh, the channel. I think it was last week. Channels that that you should should be trying to find, and that sometimes the name will change and it might be harder to find it. And so next level gardening is one of those kind of channels. So great information. Nice to have you here. And uh, always nice to, to see us supporting each other. Yeah, definitely check out Next Level Gardening. That, one of the nice things that, that I like about the channel, and, and, and you see it on my channel. You saw it on my Saturday video where I'm walking through <laughs> my garden underneath 12 inches of snow. I'm willing to show you what goes wrong and, and my mistakes and my errors and try to give you some ideas to correct for that. And, and that's one of the wonderful things about the Next Level Gardening channel is you, you get to see the whole process, the good and the bad. And so 
I have a lot of respect for a lot of the YouTube creators that are not always showing just the good, pretty, green, growing garden, but instead are willing to talk about, you know, the problems with compost and creating new gardens and killing plants with possible herbicides that show up that you didn't know about. And, you know, look for those kind of channels and you can definitely learn a lot from that. So nice to have you here. SJK was very inspired by your snowstorm video. This weekend I had to rent a trailer, get compost, unload all by myself, and I almost gave up. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for that. And thank you for that super chat. And and that's why I did it, was was to help inspire not only you all, but me as well. It does get discouraging to be out in the garden and you start seeing that things go wrong. But when you can talk about it, when you can share it, when you can encourage others to recognize that it happens to all of us, something bad just seems to happen on a regular basis, regardless of where you're at. Australia is underneath torrential rains right now, if you've seen some of the self-sufficient me videos. And and Tony O'Neill last year at Simplified Gardening was showing videos of the endless days of rain that they were getting in the UK. There, all of us are going to battle something. One of the common themes that a lot of us that are making the videos on YouTube have is we've been doing this for a long time years and years and years. So we have a lot of those kind of stories to talk about. We've learned a lot of lessons because a lot has gone wrong with all of us in our garden. So uh, keep keep in there, SJK. Yeah, it can be a lot of work, especially when you do it by yourself. So I have a, I have a video coming up. Um, I've shot all the footage. I've got it mostly edited. I'm just trying to figure out when I'm going to release it. And so when I built my greenhouse, I did it by myself. And I would not recommend you build a, a greenhouse kit by yourself. It can be done. That's why I wanted to do it and, and show that in a video. But there is so much that can go wrong when you try to do things by yourself. But the flip side of that, and this is one reason why I like to do so much by myself, is just the the sense of accomplishment just that that reward you get for a job well done and so getting the trailer getting the compost unloading it i'm hoping that you just feel good that you did that probably got some sore muscles you were questioning that activity all, all along but i'm guessing that you'll be able to sit back and say i did that and that's the way i approach most of my gardening is working and struggling and doing almost all of it by myself but then sitting back and when you see the results when you see the plants growing when you eat that harvest you can say i did it i did it i had encouragement but i did it so hang in there sjk there's a lot more good times ahead and probably a lot more of those big projects that are going to make you tired and question why you're doing it okay yeah and 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 prepper chris points out a good point as well um yeah a lot of us don't have a choice we have to do it by ourselves if we're going to garden and so there's nothing wrong with that i i encourage you've heard me say this before i encourage everybody to get their family involved to get their kids involved to get their friends and neighbors and fellow gardeners involved but ultimately when it comes to our garden most of what we're doing is by ourselves. And I, I find that very rewarding. And, and I'll actually talk a little bit about that at the end today as we start in, into the philosophy phase to finish up. But uh, always nice to, to have that success. That's why I look for those successes, because if I'm going to be doing it by myself, I want it to be worthwhile. So if I'm going to get a load of compost and empty all of that, I want it to be worthwhile. I want to learn about what I'm doing and have those successes that I can then brag about. Sheena's Gardens wondering, is it still snowing in Colorado? So no, so it snowed yesterday, but it has actually cleared up today. We're supposed to get rain tomorrow, which, as I said in that video, we haven't had real rain in months and months and months. So it's not snowing right now. The temperatures are 
supposed to stay warmer. We're supposed to have some rain, but then of course it's warming up in the next couple of days. And, and, and so just from a comparative point of view, on Saturday, it was below freezing with a foot of snow. This next Saturday, just one week away, the forecast right now is for 90 degrees Fahrenheit, no rain. That's about uh, 32 degrees Celsius. And summer's going to be here. And, and that's kind of the way it works in Colorado is a week like this, where we almost quite literally go from winter to summer in a one week period. And, you know, trying to deal with what you're going to do with, with your plants is just crazy. And so I, I wanted to talk about that as well when we talk about how to protect our garden and how to protect our plants is having a plan for your specific climate and weather patterns. And so what do you do to harden off your plants and what do you do before the plants get in the ground? As I talked on Saturday, I delay the whole process. So one way that I protect my plants, because every year we have this pattern from winter to summer, almost literally overnight. So I give myself a buffer every year, two, sometimes three weeks after my last frost date until I really do most of my planting in my vegetable garden. That's protecting my plant. The policy, insurance policy for my garden is basically timed to start at an appropriate date on the calendar that we can get past all of this crazy weather. And so I protect my garden by choosing to do the specific activities in my garden at the best time for my plants. And I have no doubt that the, the, the big box stores here in Colorado have been selling peppers and tomatoes and and all those warm season plants for weeks. And every year there are thousands of people in my region who have the warm weather, they go to the box store, they see these plants and they put them out in their garden. And then every year we get the snow and the freeze and the plants die. I learned that the hard way many, many years ago. And I know this year there are many new gardeners that are learning that the hard way as well. Those are the kind of lessons you have to learn for yourself. That's where the Garden Journal comes in and you keep track of those lessons along the way so that you can choose the best time to put the plants in the ground. And choosing the right time and the right location and the right plant is protecting the outcome of your garden for the end of the season. So think about that as an option. Pa Patrick, nice to see you here. Thank you for that contribution. I've changed my last frost date from May 15th to June 1st forever here in 5B. And yeah, yeah, that's exactly, and, and that's, I, I call it a buffer, but yeah, that's exactly what I do. My last frost date is May 18th, give or take a day. And I don't even think about putting the, the plants in the ground that need warm temperatures until June 1st. Don't even think about it because uh, it's the, the zone may technically still be of zone 5B, but the weather patterns just show for me that I just use June 1st as my average last frost date at, at, for planning purposes. Or, or actually, it's not so much the, the average last frost, frost date. It's more than 90% frost date statistically. But for me, that works better. And so I completely agree with you, Pat, that that recognizing that and then modifying how and when you garden protects all of your efforts and what's going to end up happening in your garden along the way. So definitely take that under advisement because I think it can make a big difference. Carlos saying we have to guess here in Northeast Nevada, June 1st is a guess for me because we can have snow into the 4th of July and have had. And so now let's put these these two ideas to, together of what we're talking about today when, when we're protecting the garden. I talked about the hoops and having the hoops to put up hail cloth or bird netting or whatever it happens to be. This, this holds true as well. We here in my portion of Colorado, I want to say it's June 6th or June 7th is the latest recorded snow 
but we have had freeze or frost down to um, I think June 10th, give or take a little bit. And so even in, in Nevada, some of those mountainous regions can get those freezing conditions or snow into July. If you have hoops in place, and if you have the plastic already cut and sized on those nights in the worst case situation, you just cover your plants. And so I have pre-cut plastic sheets in my shed that if that happens in June, or usually for me it's September, I'm ready. I just grab that sheet, throw it over the entire bed, clamp it in place, and I've given those plants a fighting chance for that one night. And, and that's, again, understanding your specific garden and your specific weather patterns. For me, in this part of Colorado, every year, just like the, the weird May freeze that we seem to always get, we have one day like that in September. And it usually happens about the third week in September. One night, one night where the temperature drops down to freezing. And if we can protect our plants on that one night, it's usually followed by at least three more weeks of warm weather. And so I have a choice every year, not to protect my plants and my season ends the third week of September, or protect my plants and the season ends the second week of October. Think about that. So even in July or any other time of the year, if you can get an extra two or three weeks in your gardening season, how much is that worth to you? And so hoops and plastic might be the option late in the season. That's definitely what I, what I do. And I actually have a video, I just watched it again, um, a couple days ago about protecting your plants in at the end of the season and that's exactly what I do I cover everything with plastic just to get that extra little bit of protection Yankee sister homestead happy Monday to you taking advantage of nice 70 degree weather that's 21 Celsius to work on landscape mulch projects listening and supporting this great channel blessings blessings to you Yankee sister always nice to have you here and always nice to have people actually in the garden listening while you're gardening. I think that's that's the best of both worlds to be able to to hear the gardening world around you through your ears while you're actually engrossed in the gardening world in front of you. So that's fantastic. And just a reminder for any of you who uh, are coming in late in about 20 minutes, we're going to announce the winner of the autographed copy of Tony O'Neill's book composting masterclass and I'm actually got some new technology to show you today as part of that and my daughter Kiri and her daughters were actually instrumental in making all of that happen and you'll see more of that uh, Kiri's working right now but the plan is for her to actually check in with us in about 20 minutes and she'll be involved in the unveiling of the name of the winner so Look for that at uh, on the hour, as close to 10 o'clock my time as we can be. And you'll find out who gets to, to walk away with that autograph copy. So, okay, let's see. Laura's saying, what's crazy is I don't think our four inches of snow we got here counted as a frost because it didn't actually get down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but it would have frozen my plants. And so depending on, so frost is actually defined in a couple different ways depending on how it's used and depending on how it's measured and so 35 degrees fahrenheit which is about one and a half degrees celsius can actually be frost conditions and most of us in in the gardening world when we talk about the the frost we're talking about 32 degrees then when you get down which is freezing zero celsius then when you get down to 28 degrees Fahrenheit, which is minus two Celsius, that's a hard freeze. So you actually have frost that happens at about 35 degrees Fahrenheit, freeze that happens at 32 Fahrenheit, and hard freeze at 28 Fahrenheit. Now, that's variable because depending on the plant, you, you'll have some damage at, at one point and not the other point. You have air con air temperature that plays a role. You have the ground temperature that plays a role. So there's a lot of other factors involved. 
But as far as the snow, the snow is an insulator. So regardless of how cold it is outside the air temperature, the temperature around the plant is going to be around 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius, because that's the temperature of frozen water that is surrounding your plant. And so uh, it's, it's interesting the different plants and how they've evolved to be able to fight the cold. And even some of those plants that that would be damaged by a frost aren't damaged by ice and, it, and, it's, and it's really counterintuitive but now you have to get to the thermodynamics of water and how it actually cr it, it it requires heat to to melt the the snow and the ice and that's actually what's protecting the leaf it, it's just crazy physics and crazy science but but yeah and and, and as i talked about on saturday you get these big orange orchards in Florida that are spraying the leaves of their trees so that they'll freeze. And that actually protects the leaves. And so the leaves might be damaged by a frost, but they're not damaged by the ice on the leaf, which is just craziness. But that's the way it happens. So uh, that's an interesting observation you have, Laura, because it's 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 counterintuitive sometimes that that the snow can actually cause less damage than the cold air temperature without the snow. So, the craziness of physics in the garden. Andrea says, I also have a physical barrier, but somehow it just keeps getting in. Just want an extra deterrent if possible. I use cages and chicken wire. And so um, the, the physical deterrence, when we talk about protecting our garden and protecting our plants, Think about the pest you have specifically if there's one you're trying to deal with and you might be able to have a very simple system. There are some studies and you can see some research online for deer fences of all kinds of different designs. And some of them are just two wires that are strong at very specific heights above the ground. And when the deer encounters those wires, they go someplace else. They're not going to jump the wire, especially uh, deer are actually relatively stupid animals. And so when they encounter something like a wire that's in front of them, they don't know what it is and they'll walk away. And in some cases, it, it almost scares them to the point that that they'll stay out of that area. If they can't see the height of the fence, can't see where they're going to land, they won't jump it. And so you could use that to your advantage when you're you're trying to deter deer specifically. But there are a lot of other animals that fall into that, that category. Depending on the animal and the type of fence, all you have to do is just keep them from jumping the fence or digging under the fence and coming to your garden. If it's easier for them to just keep on walking, then they're going to keep on walking. And so keep that in mind. And so another aspect and and i i did this with my deer as well is to use the physical barrier and to use plants that are known to to deter some of these pests and so in my my front yard at the last house i didn't have everything fenced i had the trees fenced i had some of the bushes fenced but most of the garden was not fenced and i grew some plants that i knew the deer would eat. So in large beds, I would grow those plants in the middle of the bed, and then I would surround those plants with the, or those good plants that the deer will eat. I would surround those plants with other plants that the deer were less likely to eat. And so in one bed in particular, I was actually to able to grow some tulips, which are like candy to the deer. But around the tulips, I had lavender surrounding the entire bed. And then at different points in that bed, I had ornamental grasses. And so when the deer would come to that bed, they would encounter the lavender and the ornamental grasses, which were not their favorite food, and they would just keep walking. They would never actually step into the bed to eat the tulips that were growing in the middle. So you can use plants as a way to protect other plants. You may have heard me 
talk in the past about sacrificial plants, actually planting areas of your garden to entice some of the pests. So if the barriers aren't working, just redirect those pests to another area of your garden with something you're growing and letting them eat, letting them feast on, and they're more likely to leave the rest of your garden alone because it's easy for them to just stay on the edge and eat the tasty food you've given for them and not venture in past the lavender and the grasses and the mint and all those other things we might be growing to try to, to keep the, the pests away from the garden. So there's another strategy and I've had some pretty good success with that. So El Vaquero is saying, uh, use those sonic stakes that I was talking about earlier for moles and other hill building pests. I've been seeing more exit holes than mounds now, and it's been about a week. Uh, good, let's hope that works. One thing that, that you might consider, <coughs> just from experience, is to move the stakes around. <coughs> so they know where the stakes are right now, they're exiting, they're going to new areas, and so, so basically try to, to follow them with those stakes and direct them into another area and they'll keep moving and they'll keep avoiding the stakes if you leave the stakes in the same spot that's when they'll come back because they're used to that vibration or that noise uh, but moving them around a little bit yeah that, that might that might actually give you some good success with that so uh let's hope that that is what you're looking for and it all works okay let's see i'm scrolling down uh, Yogi Lai says, lots of sharp sticks in the soil help keep squirrels out, but then you have to move them and be extra careful in order to do any maintenance. Cayenne seems to be working, just starting to use it. Uh, yeah, I, I tried using some pepper, straight, pepper sprays for the squirrels and had mixed results. Um, sticks in the ground. Uh, you can also lay chicken wire just on top of the soil. So like have your mulch down and then just lay chicken wire, poultry netting on top of it and for some animals for cats for squirrels generally speaking they don't like the 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 feeling of that wire on the pads of their feet and so it helps they'll still walk on it if they're hungry enough or if they really have to get across that area but having something like that 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 they don't like to step on can definitely work but and and you can actually see videos about this on on YouTube that others have done where you can put those those wired spikes on the top of the fence that are intended to keep squirrels out and there's lots of videos of the squirrels just crawling around those spikes on the top of a fence and I've seen similar things in the beds once they know it's there they'll figure out a way to walk around it and you do have to be careful whenever you put something like that in a bed that is sharp to keep an animal out that you don't hurt yourself because you are digging in your garden bed and you forgot that you had something that was sharp in that bed so so definitely look for yourself and and, and make sure you're safe so mornings at the allotment hello to you if money is an issue an alternative to sonic stakes is just any wooden or metal stake in the ground and an aluminum drink can or plastic bottle on top the wind makes it vibrate um thanks for that i've, I've seen those being used I, I haven't actually tried it and so I, don't, I can't speak to the effectiveness personally um, but yeah that's a great idea the idea is just something something that's sending the vibrations into the ground and the noise that disrupts those animals so they go someplace else so uh, I like that idea to actually you can make your own with metal stakes and then something on top of the stake that's going to create that same vibration so good suggestion appreciate it uh, okay, let's see. Prepper Chris is saying I should write a book. After seeing how much work Tony O'Neill put into his book and all of the, the, the nightmares working with different companies for the release of it just a week ago, uh, I'm not ready to write a book anytime soon, but I appreciate that sentiment. It might happen someday when I'm, I've got lots of time on my hands and I'm no longer building cages around my my trees and bird netting and new beds and all the rest of it. But thank you for that. That's a nice idea. Um, okay, let's see as I, I, okay, so Dom Davidson said whirly gigs work. And so you, you, if you watch the video that I did on Saturday, 
I, I highlighted as a success, because I've been wanting to do this for years, <clears throat> is I put a big spinner in my garden. And so that spinner is essentially a big whirly gig. A whirly gig tends to be smaller, closer to the ground, and I've got plans for putting whirly gigs in as well. But yes, that's, that's also uh, the reason for me doing it is the whirly gig or the big spinner in the middle of where I have my fruit trees is intentional to keep the deer and any other animals, particularly the birds, away from those fruit trees because you've got those the, the spin and that tends to disrupt the, those animals and they typically don't come in. So uh, yes, Don's exactly right. Whirly gigs do work depending on what kind of pest you're trying to deal with. And, and that's that's why I did my big spinner and while I'll be why I'll be doing whirly gigs in in the future as well so thank you for that that's a that's a good tip one of those things that uh, can, can make a big difference so uh, in the house is saying to Jay Dixon mesh is good you need to get it around the tiny plant and so uh, I'll probably be showing this I'm planning a video to talk about some of these specific things I'm talking about today Around my tiny plants, what I do is, is to take my chicken wire and build a little dome and put it over those little plants. So I've got little domes and and in the hoops and the, the barriers all over my garden because I've got all kinds of pests. And so the rabbits in particular, so far, a year ago, before I put some of these in, the rabbits were eating some of my young bushes. And then I put the dome of mesh over those small plants and the rabbits haven't been eating them this year or at the end of last year. So um, in the house, thank you for that. Yes, that is a good suggestion. You can over small plants. You don't need to build a fence around it. Sometimes you could just put a little barrier on top of the little plants and that's enough to be able to deal with whatever the problem happens to be. So, <clears throat> so. Laura Full, the garden is doomed. Wait, domed, exactly. Well, for some of us, the garden is doomed, but mine is definitely domed in this case. Um, somewhere in West Texas is saying, is there a good resource that you would recommend that tells you which green tops are edible in the period after you plant them to harvest the greens? And so, um, yeah, you can actually, uh, Texas, if you look up uh, the extension, uh, website in Texas. I'm guessing they've got a fact sheet that talks about edible flowers and, and the edible tops of plants. Much of what we're growing in the garden is edible. And so by all means, look at it plant by plant. But most of the plants that we're growing for roots, the tops are edible. So for turnips, you can eat the turnips, turnip greens. And for carrots, you can eat the tops of the carrots. And for beets, the beetroot, well, the tops of the beet leaves are just absolutely delicious. So most of those type of plants, particularly the root vegetables, you should be able to eat the leaves without too much trouble. Um, some of the plants, the, the leaves might be edible, but the flavor might not be what you're after. And so um, you could eat the leaves of cauliflower and broccoli, but I'm not sure you would like the flavor compared to the actual broccoli head or cauliflower head. So as to a single resource to answer that question, see if you can find a fact sheet through extension and it'll probably give a list of that. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure a, a simple search online can give you some other similar university sites that'll, that gives you some guidance along those lines. But a lot of it depends on the plant and, and how you want to use it. <clears throat> so, hey, there's John Jude. I double that sentiment as well. Another shout out to Next Level Gardening. Next Level Gardening is excellent. So there you have it. It's always nice when, when so many of us are uh, enjoying the work of so many others. So it looks like Kiri has checked on I see that Jay is saying hello to her. Carrie Nowak, for those of you that don't know, is my daughter and helps me out around the garden, around with my, uh, along with my granddaughters. And she does a lot of behind the scenes work for this live stream in particular. And so we are at 
the top of the hour, the moment I said that I was going to give you the winner of the autographed book by Tony O'Neill. So um, Kiri sent me a video of them doing it. So um, Kiri can join along as we do this, but I'm going to try something new right now and actually show you the result. And Kiri can be here. You can ask her questions if uh, you're wondering about the process. So here we go. All right, we have all the names in the bowl, 186 of them. One. Daisy is going to mix what? them up. Oh, mix them up. Don't look. And Josie? Pick one. Pick a name. Just one. Just one, just one. This one. What does it say? Turn it around, let me see. Terry Trafton. <laughs> okay, there you have it. Terry Trafton is the winner of the autographed copy of Tony O'Neill's book. And Kiri is on now, and uh, she can answer any questions you had about that. Uh, they did, so 186 names that Kiri typed up, cut into little strips, put into the bowl. The girls mixed them all up, and then they mixed them up again, and then they drew the name. And so that was a lot of work, and a big shout out, and please let Kiri know that she's appreciated for going to all of that work. We wanted to make it as random as possible for everybody who had participated and, and put in the comments section over the last week the the composting masterclass, which is the name of Tony's book. So, um, so Terry, uh, if you are uh, watching on replay or if you check in, let me know that you know now that you won and just send me an email to gardenerscott at gardenerscott.com and include your, your uh, address and I'll pass it on to Tony and we'll get that book to you as soon as we can. There will be a delay because he's actually going to be sending it from Wales in UK. And uh, hopefully you're not in a hurry to get it. But Terry Trafton is the winner of the book. And thank you to Kiri for all of the work that she did to make that happen. Because uh, it really was a lot of work. And the reason I asked her is because I didn't want to have to do all that work. And I knew she and the girls would do a much better job at it then I would, I was just going to go through and, and assign a number to everybody and then do a random number generator. But I actually, I like the way that Kiri decided to do it with, with her and my granddaughter. So um, really appreciate that. And so Kiri says they spent about 30 minutes drawing names to win things around the house. And so don't you just love kids? So after they, they drew the name then they started going around the house. Kiri was telling me about this. And they would just pick a common household item that was in their house. And then they would pick a name to see who would win that. And now, of course, you're not really winning it. But I think in the mind of a kid to to have a drawing for half an hour of everything you own in your house, uh, I think that's just a lot of fun and, and a great way to do it. So thank you, Jay. Gardner Scott at GardnerScott.com. Uh, is always a good place to, to send that kind of information for Terry Trafton. <clears throat> and so um, keep talking to Kiri. Kiri can keep answering any questions that you have. And so uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the background today. This comes from Hrafen Knudsen, and I appreciate you sending that to me. If you have a background that you would like me to highlight in this Monday show, Go ahead and send it to Gardner Scott at GardnerScott.com as well. And so a, a, a nice garden, typical garden that you might see walking through your neighborhood. And I, I wanted to point out a couple things. You know, first off, uh, I'm a big believer in raised beds. <clears throat> but in light of what we're talking about today, low raised beds like Ruffin has can still be protected. And that's what this is. This is beautiful over here to have this tent over the entire garden bed. Now, I know that they, they sell things like this at Harbor Freight, and you can find them online, but I like the hoops and the coverings for the hoops. There's nothing stopping you from getting a tent and putting a tent over your bed. And realize that, that most of the plants that we're growing in our vegetable gardens 
don't need pollinators. So all those plants we were just talking about, all those root vegetables that we might be eating the leaves from and the lettuces and the radish and the, the spinach, all of those plants don't need pollinators at all. So you can put a big tent over your beds to keep the pests out and be able to enjoy blemish-free vegetables <coughs> at harvest time. And so this looks like what, what they did. And I, I think it's a fantastic approach. <coughs> One of the other things that I really like to point out as well is in the background, you can see the buckets and the barrels and the grow bags. And this, this just looks like a typical gardener's garden to me, where you're, you're not doing it to showcase a single plant or a single bed. And that's why I really like when you all send the, the photographs of your gardens, because we can see how other people are gardening, just like how we garden. <coughs> and this is how I garden with a lot of things just all around, different things that I'm using. Uh, I've got the hoses that are lying across the pathways. This is a really good idea, I think. You've got grass all the way around the beds, but next to the beds, you have pathways to keep the, the weeds from growing in or keep the grass from growing into your beds. Yet another way to think about protecting our plants. If you can keep the weeds out from, from competing with your plants, <coughs> it's going to save you a lot of effort, a lot of work. And one way to do that is with these pathways. Keep a separation from the grass to a pathway to your bed, and you'll be able to cut down on your weeds dramatically. So uh, a couple things to just to look at. You can also see the chair right here. I always recommend a chair, a bench, just some place to just sit sit and enjoy your garden at those moments that you either have done a lot of work unloading compost or maybe it's early in the evening and you just want to enjoy the the night as as the night sets in on the garden so chairs close to the garden great idea so uh, a couple things you might be able to pull out from this i appreciate you sharing this picture and i look forward to others that you might be um, sharing as well so, and thank you, Llama Llama. I, I'll second that as well for Kiri. At least we know that you're raising kids with great hearts. So, absolutely. I just love my grandkids, of course, and they are wonderful, wonderful people already. And uh, Jay Jason saying thanks to Kiri and uh, among Kiri's. That's funny. I like that. Uh, Kiri says, to drawing momentum, awesome. They would love some. So that's nice. I was looking at some of the comments back and forth. So I appreciate everything that that is doing uh, on that. The uh, I think Kiri, um, well, I know she's got, she has some videos she's going to be posting. So for members, if you're if you if you've joined the Gardener Scott channel membership, a lot of the things like this we post on the Facebook page, videos pictures, lots of questions and answers, and, and everybody's posting pictures. You can do this of your own garden. Uh, doesn't have to wait for a background on the Monday show. So if you're not a member, definitely consider that because it's a great way for us to share information back and forth as well. So uh, always nice. So Sheena's Garden says, thank you. Everyone have a blessed day. Well, thank you to you as well. I think that's wonderful. <coughs> so um, this is one of those things that when we when we look at each other's garden, and, and I've said this so many times before, there are so many things you can learn from somebody else's garden. And, you know, specifically the topic of the day is how we protect our garden from those different pests. And everybody has discovered a secret, something that works for them that maybe very few, if anybody else, knows about. And so, you know, this tent, I've never used a tent like that, but I love that idea. I've seen them and and just discovering that you can go and, and buy something like that and put it over your entire bed. That might be a new discovery for you today. And so having that opportunity to share 
our pictures and our questions and our videos and everything else, I, I think it's just fantastic. And that's what I love so much about the Gardner Scott community is the willingness to help each other out and answer questions and show the things that are working and not working. Because we can all learn from what's not working with somebody else and hopefully avoid that or at least maybe figure out a way to overcome it. So always, always nice thing to do. Uh, Linda says, thank you again for a wonderful Monday show, Gardner Scott. Well, I'm so glad that you enjoy it. We still have 20 minutes to go. So there's a lot more to come. Melissa says, I have a pop-up tent from Costco and I would have never thought to use it for garden protection. These photos are awesome. Ah, oh, so glad you enjoyed that. You know, and, and, and that's one of those things that um, I, I, I got that idea and I've never done it, but it's this, this idea that we're talking about it <clears throat> from a, a nursery that I went to long, long ago. I don't even remember where the nursery was, but they had some issues with pests coming into their outdoor beds. And that's what they did was to put up big tents over some of their beds. And now, granted, the plants that were in those tents were specific, you know, didn't need as much sunlight, didn't need the pollinators. But it's it's an option depending on where you are and how you garden and what plants you're growing. Yeah, gardening in a tent. Who'd have thunk it? Amazing idea. I when I says they have little tents for plates you could use for small plants like the thunder domes. Absolutely. So, um, so a cloche is a French word for the glass domes that have been used for hundreds of years in gardens in France. And, and I've shown in, in the past how you can take a gallon milk jug and cut off the bottom and put that over a plant to create a cloche, a protection. And I've done that a lot, particularly in the spring. It makes a little greenhouse around the plant when you put a cloche, uh, a glass dome or a gallon milk jug over the plant. But then what? Now you take the milk jug off and you've got these, these young plants and you need more protection? Yeah, absolutely. Those little net tents that, that Iwan is talking about that you see, and they're very inexpensive. Yeah, put some of those over those young plants to keep those insect pests away. And that can be a great way to, to protect the plant. So same basic idea. But you can modify the material from glass to plastic to netting to bird netting to whatever it happens to be. And you can achieve some of the same results. Mornings at the allotment, a new member. Thank you for joining the Gardner Scott community. I appreciate that. Look forward to communicating with you on that. And, and so I will mention for um, the, 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 the two levels of the um, the training and the collaboration level next Monday. It's a holiday here in the United States. And so after the normal live stream on Monday, I'll be doing a second live stream for the training and the collaboration members uh, of the channel. And those are always nice, very small group. So just a heads up on that. And, and I'll also be announcing that on the channel page as well. So. Uh, one of those little perks for being a channel member is we do extra live streams. So uh, I still do these live streams for everybody. So that's one of the things that that most channels now, most of the bigger channels, I would say, have the membership. And it's just a way to support the channel. But this isn't a way to cut back on doing any of the other stuff. So I still have all my free videos. And I still have the, the Monday live stream. And I'll continue to do that. This is just a way for the Gardner Scott community to, to be a little more intimate and, and personable and people get to know each other a little bit through some of the things that we get to do. So uh, if, if you've ever thought about doing it, it's definitely one of those things that, that I think is a lot of fun. So, um, so Mornings at the Allotment says, I joined as Mornings at the Allotment, but will probably join the group with my pro profile right. Uh, yeah, exactly. So when you, on the Facebook page, you'll be using your Facebook profile. Uh, and, and that's the only thing that'll be different for everything else that is YouTube related, like the, the live streams, then it'll be the mornings at the allotment or whatever your YouTube name happens to be. And, and that holds true for everybody. So I need B is saying I recently bought some insect covers, 10 feet by 20 feet to drape over my cattle panel trellises in my beds. 
add a few nibbles on my bean seedlings so that bed is getting a cover first there you go and that's exactly the idea is to get those ahead of time so when you start seeing the nibbling you can throw the cover on a 10 by 20 uh, is actually a, a, a pretty big uh, panel or cover and so I'll 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 buy those and I'll typically cut them uh, to make either two or three depending on the size of the bed and so for instance my hoops that I have over the beds I have eight foot beds and for the low hoops I can put a 10 foot cover and that covers it pretty well from end to end and then the width of that bed with the hoop tends to be about six feet and so I've done that before where I'll buy a 10 foot by 20 foot uh, cover and I'll cut it into three strips and now I have three strips that are about six and a half feet by 10 feet and that's now pre-cut to cut to go over those those low hoops that I have in some of my beds and I do the same thing just adjusting the dimensions for the higher hoops that I have in the beds uh, I didn't do that and, and I have a video a couple of videos over the last couple of years with the row cover where I had a row cover I think which was like 10 by 20 feet and I have every intention of actually building an in-ground bed that long for that row cover so I didn't cut it but I still used it over my hoops there's just a lot of extra fabric around the base of that bed because I didn't want to cut it so cut it don't cut it completely up to you completely uh, your decision as to how you want to use the covers but get those covers cut those covers and have them ready to go and it makes it so much easier it's it it's one of those kind of things that you know it's it's happiness in the pain so to speak so there have been thunderstorms that I've had over the years when the hail starts to fall and I'm running out to the shed I'm grabbing the plastic I'm grabbing the hail cloth I'm grabbing the shade the shade fabric whatever it is I happen to have and then running out to, to throw that over the hoops and being pelted with hail the whole time and then I get in the house and go man that hurt but then I stop and think but all those plants are protected now so yeah it was worth a couple minutes of being pelted by hail and I didn't have to think twice everything was ready to go and I just threw the threw everything on top of the hoops so uh, if, if nothing else I think that's a takeaway from today's show is have everything prepared so that you can do it on a moment's notice Riverdale Gardens is also a new member so nice that you've joined us look forward to, to talking with you all as well both River and Dale and uh, as we move to uh, summer we're going to see so River and Dale have actually been longtime viewers but uh, one is an adult one is a child and when you've got school sometimes school gets in the way and so at least for my granddaughters Friday was the last day of school and so they're gonna be involved with the garden much more as they come to visit and I know that some of you get, yeah get your kids watching the live stream and the videos as well and hello to Trisha Wallers another new member thank you so much for joining it's gonna be nice lots of new members it's a great community and so many of you are already part of the community so um, it's, it's just so nice when people give that support and share their stories uh, I, I, their garden gardeners are just such wonderful people you haven't you haven't heard me say that before I'm sure right no I'll definitely be saying that again many many more times into the future let's see uh, okay let's get back to some of the tree stuff so I went I was saying so Dave Wilson so uh, I have some videos on how I prune my trees and how I plant my trees and Dave Wilson is a nursery in California I believe California or Oregon I think it's California uh, who has some videos about pruning trees and this storm that we just had here in Colorado broke a lot of branches off a lot of trees and so if you're looking if you've had damage in your garden or if you just want to know how to prune your trees 
Yeah, I'll give a shout out to Dave Wilson Nursery because uh, they, they have some really good videos on how to prune trees in particular. And uh, especially if you've got damaged trees uh, as a result of some of the weird weather we've been having in the United States, it's always nice to, to get the, 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 the experts, the ones that are growing the trees that you're actually buying, and they're showing you how they prune the trees at the nursery. And that's Dave Wilson. So thank you for mentioning that. Eggnog Brownies, also a new member of the Gardner Scout community. So nice to have you along as well. That's fantastic. There are there are a couple hundred of us. And so um, not everybody is on Facebook, um, but that is a primary point of meetup for everybody. And then I, I also post things for members only on my channel page from time to time. And it's a great way for, for not just my channel, but every channel. Uh, if you have favorite channels and you note that they the join button or if they have a, a join link in the description, check it out. Um, I think the perks that, that we have are better than just about any other channel out there. Not every channel has perks, but it is a great way to support the channel. And for a lot of the channels, it's a great way to, to form a community. And so, so um, uh, I, I think I'm pretty sure Next Level Gardening's got... A community you can jo join. I know Tony O'Neill at Simplify Gardening has a community you can join, and you'll see posts uh, from us that are only to the members and, and a lot of thank yous along the way. So it's, it's definitely uh, appreciated. And so uh, I walked through the, the garden this morning. So I always like to highlight the good stuff. And uh, of course, we'll talk about the bad stuff, but those good things that that happened and so last year i talked about it being the firsts is what i called it the first time you see something in the garden or the first time that that something happens or the first time you do something in the garden and make note of that i think that's a big part of creating gardening memories well today i had one of those moments it was it was just so fantastic so we had snow over the weekend a little bit of snow yesterday i kind of went out to the garden a little bit <clears throat> not a lot uh lily didn't go out any further than the deck mala was running but but by yesterday wasn't as much snow so she wasn't having as, as much fun as as you saw in the video so this morning was really the first day i went out to inspect the garden and to see what kind of damage the 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 storm that 12 inches of snow put onto the trees which is what i was most worried about and the trees actually look pretty good. Didn't really see damage that I ex expected. It looks like they've bounced back pretty well. Even with the hard freeze, they seem to be doing okay. So I was I was so glad to, to see that my trees survived. But while I was out there, I heard a hummingbird. My first hummingbird of the season. And it's a little bit early, so as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to mix up some sugar solution and hang my hummingbird feeder, which I normally don't do until June, but, but there's at least one hummingbird that's flitting around my garden. And they were in the trees in my neighbor's yard, and so if I put the feeder out, they're nearby, they're looking for food, and, and, and that's just one of those moments, one of those firsts, that is just so exciting. I've already, I, last week on my my lilac bushes, I, I saw my first bumblebee. I'd seen some honeybees in the garden, but that was my first bumblebee on the lilacs. So my garden is waking up. I know most of you, your garden has been awake for months, but for me, this is really exciting. And, and I saw a, 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 a comment online that said, we think, we nurture our gardens, but our gardens really nurture us. And that's the kind of moment I had this morning. I was out in the garden expecting to see the damage, hoping the plants survived, and thinking what I was going to do when I discovered all that the damage. And the damage didn't happen. So there was that moment, that heartwarming moment for me of like, oh, everything made it. And then I heard the hummingbird. And it was a beautiful moment. 
it was one of those gardening moments where everything is wonderful in the garden in that moment. And in that moment, the garden was nurturing me. All of the positive energy of the universe was flowing through the sound of that hummingbird past all of my undamaged trees into my heart. So think about how your garden can nurture you. And so something as simple as a chair that enables you to just sit and enjoy the space to listen to the hummingbirds, to look for the bees flitting around. I'm hoping to add a bat house to my garden this year because there are those moments when I'm out in my garden in the early evening that I see the bats, just a couple of them usually, but they're flying over the garden. So I'm going to nurture the bats so that hopefully the bats will not only be a beneficial predator against some of those insects in my garden, but just something to look at, something to enjoy, to see that nature in the garden on those early evenings. The garden definitely nurtures me, and that's what I'm always encouraging for all of you as you become better gardeners. And as you spend more time in the garden, it's not all work. Get away from that work mindset. And even though you expect to see the bad stuff, relish when all the bad stuff didn't happen and everything is good. And you never know, a hummingbird might actually flit by and be that happy sound to carry you through the rest of the week. So I just wanted to share that with you and, and, and ask you for yourself, how does your garden nurture you? And what can you do to have more of those nurturing moments? There are studies that have shown that if you put your hands into soil, that it actually generates chemicals within the body that make you feel better. So physically, literally, scientifically, you can just put your hands into nice warm soil and that act alone will make you feel better. Your garden is nurturing you with every contact you have with your garden. So get out there, make that contact, touch those plants. The, the, the insect frass that we were talking about in the very beginning, that insect manure, you'll see that on your leaves. If you get up and close to your leaves, you can see the caterpillar poop that was dropped when the caterpillar was eating the leaves. That's fascinating stuff. There are times that I had caterpillars in the greenhouse at the Galileo Garden that I didn't know where the caterpillars were. All I could see were the damaged leaves. But then I looked for the frass. I looked for the caterpillar poop and followed the trail until I found the caterpillars and then dealt with them. Those moments of accomplishment, those moments of touching the leaf and looking at something as small as insect frass, and then taking that next step, being the detective to follow the trail, to find the pest that was creating it, that's another one of those nurturing moments. Hey, I did everything right. I saw a pest. I tried to figure out what to do with it. I found it, and now that pest is no longer in my garden. All of the things we've been talking today about protecting your garden, those different methods, those are all things that you should be able to sit back and enjoy your accomplishment. Enjoy the success of having done all those protective actions. Even when you're sore and sweaty and it costs money and it's a pain to put in place, it's the end result that we're looking for. And it's that nurturing of the garden plants that we protected that can really help us on that journey. Colorado Bird Nerd, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that contribution. I agree, it's another wonderful gardening chat. All of our Monday gardening chats, I think, are wonderful. It's a chance for all of us to get together, for all of us to think about the week ahead, focus on the week that just passed, 
and also look well into the future to all those moments when we're going to just love being in the garden. Even on those snowy moments when we think the worst turns out to be sometimes those are the best moments and create the best memories because I just love that first hummingbird of spring. Hope you have a great gardening week. We'll see you here next Monday. Same time, same channel, same wonderful gardening community. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.